might be a good time. But we're talking this morning about not so random encounters. During the season of Lent, we've been looking at some of the encounters that Jesus had throughout his ministry and on the way to the cross. We've looked at, uh, actually the Sunday before Lent, we looked at Jesus as the ultimate undercover boss from Philippians chapter 2. We talked about uh, his encounter with Satan in the wilderness and his encounter with Nicodemus, the man who came to him at night. And today we're going to look at uh, several encounters. It comes out of the 15th chapter of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to that. If you uh, want to follow along. We're going to see a little bit of that right now. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God. He is not to honor his father with him. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? (laughs) Jesus asked them, Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands (laughs) does not make him unclean. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, David, have mercy on me! My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession! 
Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him. Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me. She said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord. She said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking and the blind sea, and they praise the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, for they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where could we find such a remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven. They replied, A few small fish. told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000, besides women and children. It's not much more of a diverse group of people than Jesus ran into in the 15th chapter of Matthew. I call it um, encounters with the hard-hearted, the thick-headed, the faith-filled, and the needy multitudes. And let's very quickly look at those this morning. First of all, let's look at the hard-hearted, the Pharisees. They came to Jesus with a challenge and said, your, your 
disciples violate the traditions of our Father. Now, now the traditions were interpretations of the Old Testament law. In other words, in order to take what was, what was written and to put it into practice, you needed, it needed to be interpreted. So, so the traditions were interpretations, and they'd been handed down over the centuries, and you could call those the unwritten laws. In other words, they, they were the way that things were done, even though it wasn't said. And of utmost importance to this small group, relatively small group of very influential people, was cleanness and was holiness. And how they... Uh, wanted to remain pure. Did you see how, I don't know if you caught it or not, how they replied, how they responded when Jesus handed them something to eat? No. Uh -uh. Don't want it. The tradition, and Jesus replied about this, their, their tradition that they called Korban, was a tradition that said if you, if you donated or if you pledged or if you committed a certain amount to the temple, then then uh, you could not use it really for anybody else in that sense, although you could use it for yourself if you wanted to. And so Jesus said, by your tradition of devoting things to the temple, you are nullifying God's law by, take, by not taking care of your parents. And in those days, there was no Social Security. There were no 401Ks. There were no pensions. There was family. And family took care of of family. And so Jesus said, by your traditions, you are nullifying the law of God. And a child could get around taking care of, you know, particularly a child who was devious could get around his responsibility to his parents, whether anything was actually given or not, and they were violating God's law by their tradition. You see, the Pharisees were so tied up in their tradition that they'd lost sight of the purpose of the law. They couldn't see that God was at work in Jesus because Jesus did not conform to their expectations. Now, they weren't alone in this. The disciples didn't fully understand what Jesus was doing. But, but tradition has a habit of becoming so rigid, and it tends to exclude all of those that don't measure up. Tradition can suck the life out of faith. Think about Jesus' words in Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 4, when he's talking about the church of Ephesus. He says, you know, you're doing all of these things right. You have everything straight, but you've lost your first love. You got it all right, but you got it all wrong. And tradition can keep us from seeing what God is doing. Now, tradition is a knife that cuts both ways. You know, people with old traditions can't for the life of them figure out the new traditions. And unfortunately, sometimes those that are involved in newer traditions scoff at the old ones. You see, tradition has a way of controlling people. And tradition even attempts to control God. If we're going to do it this, 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 and this, why do we need God? How often have unwritten laws, how often have, have traditions been the death of believers and even churches? How often, I'm not just talking about we've never done it that way before. How about the, the, the sense of if you, if, you, if you don't do it this way, it's wrong. Now, there's a flip side to that. How often, does un, how often does scrupulous outward behavior hide a heart that's full of evil? A number of years ago, 25 years ago, I don't know how long ago it was, probably, a man by the name of Jimmy Swaggart those of you that are old enough to remember, you know where I'm going with this. He was deaf on sexual immorality. He would stomp back and forth, back and forth on his televised program, and he would rail against Hollywood, he would rail against sin, he would rail against sexual sin in particular, until it was discovered that he was using prostitutes on a regular basis himself. 
Jesus said it's not what goes in that messes you up. It's what comes out that messes you up. Now, tradition is not inherently bad, but it's got to be monitored so that we don't miss what God's doing. And see, sometimes you know, we have to be careful that we don't become plants that God uproots or that we don't become blind guides simply for the sake of our tradition. And maybe, maybe you come from a place where tradition was more valued than the gospel. I remember uh, I was, and this is a number of years ago, I was working with a couple who were getting married in premarital counseling, and they were fairly young, quite young actually. And the young lady had come from a very, very, very rigid spiritual background. And she said, Pastor, I can't even say the word holiness without almost getting sick. When our traditions trump the gospel. And then there were the thick headed. These are the disciples. You probably knew that. How often did Jesus have to chide his disciples for their dullness? Take, just, just take a listen at a few scriptures. And this one here, Matthew 15, 16, Jesus said, Are you so are you still so dull? Matthew 16, 11, How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread, but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Luke 18, 34, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. Luke 24, 25, he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then in 14, 9 of John, Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been with you for so long? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Dull. Now we look at them and laugh. We look at them and we say, oh, yeah, yeah, they, they were so slow. They were so dumb. Well, you know, we've read the explanations. You know, I can, I can, I can look at a, at a puzzle, and if I have peeked ahead and looked at the answer, and by the way, that's the way I do puzzles. <laughs> Don't bring puzzles to me. <laughs> no, 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 I'll find the answer in the back of the book. Well, we've already looked at the back of the book, and we've seen how the, how, how, how the puzzles turn out. But how many times has Jesus had to chide you and me for the same old attitude, the same old actions, the same old stuff that we get tripped up on? Every now and then we just need to look in the mirror and say, Are you still so dull? Don't you get it? It's kind of like when a kid is trying to learn algebra and the, and the difference in concepts. And I guess, I, I never made that leap from math to algebra. I mean, I, no, I, I but I didn't. I tried, but I didn't. And, and, and I guess, now don't correct me here publicly, but you know, pull me aside later on. I guess basically algebra is just kind of a shortcut of, of math. Just like multiplication is, is a shortcut of addition, algebra is kind of a shortcut of whatever. I never got it. But it's kind of fun to watch somebody that does. Oh, I know how that works. But how often does the Holy Spirit have to convict us of something that is out of sync with him. How often have you said to yourself, when will I learn? How often does Jesus say, how is it that you are still so dull? How often are we so entangled in the temporal that we miss the spiritual? How often? How many years has the Holy Spirit been trying to teach you about how to live for Jesus and you just don't get it? 
And then there's the faith-filled. This dear little Canaanite woman. Now, Canaanite was a word filled with meaning. Canaanite, the Canaanites, if you know your Old Testament, were the ones who ancient Israel were to drive out of Israel before they settled the land. The Canaanites were the ones that had so disgusted God that he said, wipe them off the face of the earth. If you want to really get somebody mad, call them a Canaanite. Because Canaanite was kind of similar to, to dog, infidel, unreachable. They were about as far from God as you could get. And here came one wanting Jesus' help. Verse 26. He replied, or verse 23 rather, excuse me. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Now, usually about this time we get offended at Jesus. But let me tell you a quick story. In 1970, in December, my wife and I had been married about a year, and we had decided that we were going to leave our, our home area of Bay City, Michigan, and we were going to move to Olivet, where I would finish my education for the ministry. And so we kind of wrestled with that. We worked all, all through, and, and finally, after Christmas, um, uh, somewhere around the 27th, 28th of December, we loaded up the truck. Everything we owned was about eye level, and it took up half of a 12-foot U-Haul. Everything we owned. And so we went out to my parents' house, which was about 30 miles out in the country, and, and we were going to spend the night there. And the next morning, we were going to tear down the bed that we were going to sleep in that night because we were taking that with us. That was my bed from when I was a kid. And so we got there, and... and and, uh, and, and I don't know, I really don't remember what all transpired. But my dad and I were out in the garage, and I don't know if we were working on something or, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I, honestly, I kind of felt like I needed to be out there, you know, that he wanted me to be out there, that I should be out there, that even though I really would have been rather inside, I should be out there helping. You know how it goes when dad's around sometimes. And we were working away and all this other kind of stuff, and, and all of a sudden... He looked at me and he said, Get in the house and get ready for supper. That's somehow, sometimes the way Dad talked to me. Get in the house and get ready for supper. I thought, what do I do now? Man, he's always yelling at me. I'm almost 20 years old. And he's still yelling at me. So I went in the house and got ready. You know, you know how you feel after something like that? Well, it wasn't too long, and people started showing up. And friends and family, and pretty soon it dawned on me. Oh, they're having a farewell party for us. That's why Dad talked to me the way he did. I think it's a little bit with this woman here. You see, Dad knew something that I didn't. And Jesus knew something that this woman probably didn't. Now there's all kinds of theories and and you know I'm you know whatever. But Jesus knew that there was genuine faith in this woman and, and maybe he wanted to draw it out a little bit. Because she became a tremendous testimony of what persistence is. And maybe Jesus also wanted the disciples to see just how far the gospel would go. A Canaanite a Canaanite. What do you want to bother with a Canaanite for? They're dogs. They're infidels. They're worse than half-breeds. Those were the Samaritans. And then the final group of people are the needy. The needy multitudes, the hurting and the hungry. And you know, this is the picture that, that what, what most people think uh, when they think of Jesus. This, this last few scenes of that particular video and, and this particular chapter. I don't know if you noticed or not, but that's word for word of 
what's in the Bible. And, you know, they see Jesus, you know, touching him. Man, how many times have I wished that I could touch anybody and everybody that was sick and they would walk away well? We'd have to rent out the mark to have church. But that doesn't happen. Some places in the world today it is, but so far it's not. But that's the picture that so many... And, and now we know more. I mean, you know, we, I mean, we know that there is more to Jesus than, than this. But what a beautiful, beautiful image. Well, they, these people were mostly considered outsiders, less than worthy by the elite. If they had a religion, it was the wrong one. If they had any kind of faith, it didn't matter. They were not worthy of God's attention. But they were worthy of Jesus' attention. And their descendants need to experience the love of Jesus too. Well, not their physical descendants, their societal descendants. You know, the, the people that are kind of outside, the people that are kind of outcast, the people that are just, that, that don't smell good. They need Jesus too. So, let's make sure that our hearts are open to what God is doing, even if it doesn't seem to be quite kosher. And let's make sure to keep our head in the game of life and faith and pay attention to the Word and the Spirit so that the times when we have to hear, are you still so dull, become fewer and farther between. And let's remember that persistence really does pay. And the result is worth the wait. And let's understand that nobody is beyond the reach of the gospel of God. Nobody. Nobody. So that brings us to your connection card. Take it out. Seth, you want to get... Yeah, thank you. Maybe somebody you know fits into one of these categories. Maybe there are some people that are so hard-hearted that you wonder even if, if they would even think about responding. Maybe there are those that are just, you know, just don't get it. Just don't get it. Or maybe there are those that, that you know, pretty much um, respectable people don't mix with. Or maybe there are those that uh, just kind of out there somewhere. Or, or maybe there's somebody that you've given up on. Maybe there's somebody, you've, you know, man, I've, you know, how many times have I asked them? Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. Well, let's try it one more time, shall we? I plan to invite... And there's lines there for a first name. You don't even have to put a second name. For a first name. I plan to invite for Easter Sunday. A couple weeks ago, my Schwan man came by. And uh, he's a good kid. Lives down in Matherville, actually. I said, Aaron, his name's Aaron. I said, Aaron, I said, you need to be in church on Easter Sunday. And you need to be here. And we've talked about church before, so, you know, we had a relationship there. So, you know, as we sing the first part of this song, just let God bring people to your mind for Easter Sunday. And maybe it's someone of a, diff of a different faith. Maybe you have the kind of a relationship with a Muslim that would say, hey, would you come celebrate Jesus' resurrection with me? Whew. That's stepping outside, isn't it? What do you think? Let me pray, and we're going to sing. Father in heaven, today, thank you for this very vivid reminder of the compassion and the love of God. All of us fling ourselves at your feet begging for mercy because that's all 
that's all that we can that's all that we can claim is your mercy. And God help us, we pray. As we think about, as you bring people to mind, help us just to jot them down. And Lord, help us to be praying for opportunities. Nothing more. Hey, come to church on Easter and worship with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing, go ahead, just kind of get us started, Seth. If you turn those cards in, I'll make it a point to pray for those people that you will have the opportunity and they will reply. Amen. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hill, where your blood was spilled, through my ransom. Oh, 
the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.